Hi, everybody. Today, we're talking everything to do with diet. Two really important questions. One, is diet the cause of IBD? And secondly, how far off are we from dietary therapy for inflammatory bowel disease? This is a talk I gave at St. Mark's on Friday, which I've sat down to record for you. Here is the overview. We will put timestamps in the show notes so that you can skip ahead if of interest. Who gets IBD and why? What are the dietary components that may be causative in IBD? This is complex, and we'll do a deep dive into each of these. What are the dietary strategies to prevent IBD in at-risk individuals? What about diets of treatment for IBD? Where are we to induce remission, to prevent the disease from flaring? And then what can we practically do today? Advice and challenges to patients and parents. What are the opportunities? What are the barriers? including adherence and the societal pressures that we have with all of this today. So the gut is really amazing. It is the center point for which diet, the microbiome, and our immune system meet, all of course on a genetic background. And it has a very complicated job to do, to process the bits that are good, to avoid the bits that are harmful. And in inflammatory bowel disease, this does break down. We have chronic inflammatory bowel conditions with a dysregulated mucosal immune response, an altered microbiome, and environmental and genetic drivers. We know that the diseases relapse and remit, they progress over time. We know we need medical and surgical therapy in most, if not all, patients. And we do now have a very big unmet need and a lot of unanswered questions, nonetheless then how do we think about diet in inflammatory bowel disease? So who gets IBD and why? Well, let's have a look at the epidemiology. This has changed dramatically. Just 150 years ago, we have the first descriptions, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. We have then this rising incidence in the Western world, North America, Northern Europe. And then much more recently, this has shifted. So if we look at this bit by bit, we can see before 1960, just really descriptions in Northern Europe and across Northern America. Then we start to see uh, Australia, we see the Far East um, emerging in Japan um, and some other hotspots like South Africa. And now what do we see? We see this emergence in the Indian subcontinent across the Far East, the Middle East and across South America too. And if we look, to the future, well, IBD is getting more and more common. It's already approaching 1% in the UK. We have this data from us here and from Gil Kaplan in North America. This will probably, if you go right to the far right-hand panel here, max out at prevalence equilibrium somewhere around the 2% mark. But then we can go to the left-hand panel and we can look at the countries where IBD is just emerging. And here we have to look to the African continent, the acceleration in instance phase, this middle panel, which is what's happening in South America, across the Middle and Far East. And this appears to be something that's happening as these countries are urbanizing. The environment is shifting. And it shifted, of course, very dramatically from when we were um, plant-eating or fruit-munching primates. A lot of the shift has come very recently. And it's very tempting to think, well, maybe not very much of this has to do with our genetics, given that that's really been quite static for a while. Our genes, our um, environment, and our microbiome interact. There is this really fantastically complex interplay here. And what we eat is mediated through our microbiome interacts with our mucosal immune system there. And this is all differing on our genetic background. And that's a lot of what's going on with IBD. So if we think about primates with whom we share 98% of our DNA to um, more ancient man, even if we just go you know, maybe 10,000 years ago before the advent of farming, our DNA is pretty similar there, but the environment has shifted very rapidly. I do want just to have a word about Genetics, that's what we have been doing a lot of in IBD in the last 20 years. The poster child of 
complex disease genetics here. We've got a very detailed map now of the genetic architecture of inflammatory bowel disease. We know a lot, in particular, around Crohn's disease, around defective killing of intracellular bacteria, of defective autophagy and innate immunity with Nod2 and ATG16L1, IRGMM, to just name a couple, but also these defects in barrier function and adaptive immunity too. Now, we would say that our genetics is fairly set for now, but this fascinating recent paper in Nature looks at the impact of the Black Death or the bubonic plague. And if you look at the bottom right at the population of London over the time from 1000 to 1600 AD, you can see the massive impact of the Black Death. And it's very interesting to look at this. If you do a genome-wide association study of genetics prior to and post the Black Death, you can start to see positive selection for some genes. And the four major genes that come up include these alleles within the ERAP1 and 2 gene, which is a Crohn's disease-associated gene. So it may very well be that genetics that helped you survive the Black Death actually now put you at increased risk of Crohn's disease. And we see perhaps a similar legacy if you go back to look at tuberculosis and possibly also to malaria. What about the microbiome? Well, the microbiome is fantastically complicated. We are just scratching the surface of what we understand about the microbiome. And I think we will unlock this in the next five to 10, possibly 20 years, but we will really get um, a handle on what's going on here. For now, we know that there is an observed dysbiosis in IBD. We're not very good at understanding how much of that is cause and effect. We can start to think about the impact of our environment on our microbiome and therefore how that may impact us. This study looked at paleo archaeology or paleofeces, ancient stool specimens preserved from humans around the world, mostly I think in Mexico, from about 2,000 years ago. So if you look here, you can see these red dots. These overlay with these crosses. These crosses are from stool samples from modern humans who are in non-industrialized settings. And then if you look on the left, you see these triangles. These triangles are from modern humans in an industrialized setting. So ancient microbiome of humans 2,000 years ago looks very much more similar to non-industrialized humans. So this gives, I think, us an important clue. So which part here then of our environmental penalty is important in IBD? Diet, I think, is going to be critical. But there's lots of other things that come with this, lots of other potential confounders. Pollution, antibiotics, surgery, stress, sunlight, vitamin D, geography, exercise, our sedentary lifestyle, hygiene. So this is an interesting and complex area. One of the things that I think is irrefutable is that the drive of humanity in the last 50 to 100 years has been towards urbanization. And this is the key demographic shift. If you look, for example, across South America, if you look in Africa now, and that is that the population is urbanizing. The biggest cities will be in Africa in the next 50 to 100 years globally as this young population moves into cities. And with that, it's tempting to then think about the change in lifestyle. Worth looking at this. This is from the US, but this shows really how recently some of our profound environmental shifts are. From flushing toilets to running water, so then these things to do with food, refrigeration, electric power, um, microwaves. Um, so really very recent shift. And in some parts of the world, of course, that's occurring more recently still. And with this, we can think about the rise of the Western diet. So these on the right on this table here are the components of the Western diet that you would not expect be available to our pre-agricultural hominins. So you can look in here and you can see uh, dairy products, refined sugars, and vegetable oils. And if we then look at this in a bit more detail, we can see sugar over the last 150 to well, 200 years here, 
with the dips in the world wars. You can then look at cooking oils, vegetable oils, and how they've increased in the last 100 years. So the Western diet, I think, appears to provide um, one of the key things that shifted in the last 50 to 100 years in the West and the adoption of a Western diet in previously non-developed countries is, I think, one of the most striking epidemiological trends. So what part of genetics, environment, and the microbiota is key? How does this interplay? And let's think, I think, just a bit around the interplay, particularly with diet, the environmental factor, and the microbiota. This study um, from David and El from Nature in 2013 now was really pivotal. Healthy people had a washout baseline diet, and then they went on to a plant-based diet, then a washout, and then onto an animal-based diet. And on the top, you can see fiber increasing and then decreasing with the diet. And you can see fat intake decreasing on the plant-based diet and then increasing on the animal-based diet. Okay, so what? That's what you might expect. But when you then look at the impact on diversity, here this is a log scale, so poorer diversity is higher on the scale. On the right, you can see that within two days of going onto the animal diet, that uh, diversity plummets. Now, this doesn't mean that eating animal protein is bad and that eating plants are good, but it does show that if you change diet, you can see a big shift in microbial diversity over a short period of time. So let's have a think about what components of diet may be, and I emphasize the may, be causative in inflammatory bowel disease. And to do this, I'm going to go through a few of these. We're going to look at breastfeeding, high-fat diet, emulsified sugars, ultra-processed foods. We're going to look at fiber, hoovers, red meat, and a couple of others thrown in there too. First, a word of caution. So if we're trying to build a solid evidence base, which we should be here for dietary factors as causative in IBD, we should remember that association is not causation that findings should be replicated. We should think and remember very carefully, and I'll show you which of these data sets are in mice, but mice are not humans, so we need to interpret that accordingly. Diet is complex, so please keep that in mind. We're gonna reduce down here to individual dietary components as best as we can, but that's not what we eat, okay? We don't just eat isolated fiber or isolated sugar or isolated fat, so we need to think about Human studies, because of the complexities of diet and our associated behaviors, are full of bias and confounding. So if you eat healthily, you may be more likely to exercise well, you may be more affluent, you may be more likely to go on holiday, be able to control your stress levels better or not. So this is a complex area that needs to be kept in mind. And unfortunately, there is a lot of very low quality data that's been published and will be touted as being in peer-reviewed journals, but actually is poor quality. And there is a lot, as we know, of misinformation and misreporting and misrepresentation in both the mainstream media and on social channels. And so this and other efforts are trying in part to debug that. So with all that in mind, and with those caveats, let's go into this. And I want to start right at the beginning, really, it makes sense to with breastfeeding, or perhaps more looking at formula feeding, and most of the data so far would suggest that formula feeding is less good and in fact may put um, individuals at a slightly increased risk of developing inflammatory bowel disease. But it's not that straightforward. This is a study from Scotland from David Wilson and colleagues recently published looking at a very large population and seeing whether or not breastfeeding type or infant feeding type had any impact on the subsequent development of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis? And the answer in this data set, I'll zoom in here so you can see in more detail, was no. So challenging the orthodoxy here a bit, but suggesting here that formula feed versus breastfeeding did not impact on um, the outcome. Okay, so that's breastfeeding. Let's move on next to a high fat diet. And here we've got very interesting, pivotal paper from Susanna Devkota 
um, at Cedar sinai in California. And this I love. So here she took a dietary factor, a high-fat diet. This was milk-derived. We then see this host factor, bile acid, toracotic acid. And bile acids, I think, are very important in IBD. More about that later. And then we've got a microbiota factor, bilophilia, what's worthier. And then, but only then, when you've got all of those plus a genetically susceptible mouse, here, IL-10 knockout, you get colitis. How interesting is that? That's high-fat diet. Emulsifiers are really interesting. Uh, Bernard Chassing published this fascinating paper in Nature suggesting that um, emulsifiers reduce mucus thickness, that they increase mucus barrier encroachment in mice. In mice, also, you get a worsening of colitis. You get a reduced microbiome diversity and an altered microbiome composition. And this colitis instance in the bottom left panel here is with carboxymethylcellulose and polysorbate 80 at concentrations that the FDA regard as safe. So emulsifiers are um, added to quite a lot of modern processed foods to make them look and feel and taste nice. The classic example at the top there is mayonnaise. Mayonnaise with emulsifiers, mayonnaise without emulsifiers is all just splits. So these relatively simple carbon-based um, chemicals you can see on top right are added, and that makes a difference. Ice cream would be another classic example. And what Bernard Chassing and others have shown um, is that um, it, it looks like when you have emulsifiers in your diet that you have more likely this encroachment across the mucus barrier, and therefore you have more um, bacteria. And if you've got a condition like Crohn's disease, perhaps, where you have defective bacterial killing intracellular, you have this propagation of chronic inflammation. Now, this has not all been shown yet. A lot of this is still hypothesis, um, but the animal data are compelling. And moreover, there is now um, a, a study designed to really see whether or not this works. So this is set up by Kevin Wheeling with James Lindsay and with, with um, Bernard Chassing involved and, uh, and others. A very interesting study. This shows the complexity of doing dietary work. To do dietary work, you need a big budget. And here they've got funding, I think, from the Helmsley to do this along with others. But you then need a very dedicated protocol with dietitians and proper foods. Emulsifiers are complex. So what they do here is they take everyone onto a baseline diet, which doesn't contain very much emulsifier at all. And then they've got randomized labeled foods that either contain or don't contain emulsifiers. So you add back in a low emulsifier supplement to some people, a high emulsifier to others. And then you see in this population with mild to moderate active Crohn's disease what happens over time, 24 weeks later on. Um, and you do a lot of extra detailed analysis on the microbiome and things, and hopefully then you start to see um, some interesting output. So, so far we've looked at formula feeding, we've looked at um, high fat diet, we've looked at emulsifiers. What's next? Well, next I want to look at sugars. This is a paper from Science Translational Medicine from a year ago. This is in mice, but this is interesting. So on the top you can see that glucose administration makes colitis worse. This study also then looked at other sugars, so looked at sucralose and fructose that all had an impact, but sucrose um, here, sorry, glucose here was, was the worst. And that was in DSS colitis, the top panels. This is then in the bottom using glucose in an IL-10 knockout. So what you see here with sugar in mice, but in a very well-conducted series of experiments that you get a worsening of colitis in two different models. You get degradation of the mucus layer and barrier function, similar to what we saw with the emulsifier story. You get a dysbiosis and you see that this sugar induced colitis is dependent on the microbiota. So that's interesting. And there's quite a lot of epidemiological work looking at sugars in IBD. A lot of it's confounded because particularly if you look at people who already have IBD, then with, with IBD, when people have 
sore guts and they don't feel like eating and they're vomiting and they're lacking in energy. And often people go to sugar rich drinks or energy drinks now to try and boost their energy levels or at least give them some calories. So there's lots of potential from founders here. On to next look at ultra processed foods. This is um, the study that caught everyone's attention. This was published in the British Medical Journal a year ago. And interestingly, there's another study that's just come out in elementary pharmacology and therapeutics from looking at biobank. Both of these studies, Pure and Biobank, were not set up to look at Crohn's disease or osteoarthritis. colitis. Both took patients, no, not patients, healthy people, mostly in their middle years of life. So here, it's maybe 40 to 50 years of age, which is different from um, most of the people that go on to develop IBD who are younger. Nonetheless, with those caveats, let's look at this. You see here an association with ultra-processed foods and the development of Crohn's disease not with ulcerative colitis. And that's the same as you saw in the biobank study. When you start to address the confounders here, this does start to return to the null, suggesting this may not be a robust association. And the authors here comment, and you can see this, that a possibility remains of residual confounding due to unmeasured or unknown confounders. And I really think this is important for us to bear in mind and this is relevant when we look at the next study here. This is looking at fiber, another big cohort designed to look at outcomes such as um, cardiovascular death, cerebrovascular death, uh, cancer, and dementia. This is the nurses' health study, recruiting people 30 to 55, but mostly at the older end of that. And then looking over time to see who developed inflammatory bowel disease. And here looking at dietary fiber broken down into quintiles of intake, you can see that people with the lowest intake of dietary fiber had the highest risk of developing Crohn's disease, again, but not ulcerative colitis. So some very interesting clues there, I think, indeed. Um, and, and these are the conclusions from the Nurses' Health Study. More mechanistic studies are needed. And it's one of the things that we can start to look, I think, with great interest in the parts of the world where the environmental shifts are happening very quickly. And Africa, I mentioned already a couple of times, this is an editorial from a study looking in Tanzania, where they looked at people in Tanzania who were already in industrialized parts of the country and people who were not still living rural lives. And they looked at the difference in diet and they did a very neat series of metabolic experiments here. You notice that there was significant lack of dietary fiber. And within this experiment, they can then start to look at some of the com complex outputs of that, increased primary bile acids, and cholesterol metabolites that may drive inflammation and actually um, drive some of the types of inflammation that we think are a key in um, inflammatory bowel disease etiopathogenesis. So a lot of interest, I think, to study there. I'm a big fan of testing your assumptions, um, and there are two recent, very um, well-conducted studies, both in cell, that have done that. Um, this is fiber still on the left. We, for a long time, have thought that fiber is king when it comes to improving your microbial diversity. You know, forget maybe all the other outcomes, but if you just think about diet and microbial diversity. However, in this human study, Dietary fiber was compared to fermented foods, slightly differently. So that's your kombuchas, um, your kimchi, um, your sauerkrauts, and some cheeses, and, and, and other yogurts, um, beers, for example. And actually, it was the fermented foods that resulted in a more favorable microbiome, not with any outcomes, but just looking at the microbiome in terms of more diversity and probably um, more anti-inflammatory effects. This is intriguing. This needs translating. The weight of the evidence so far, the body of the evidence, is with um, fiber. And fiber is um, improved by lots of plant-based fibers um, in your diet. But we will come to later how little of this has directly translated to IBD and how we need to be cautious in terms of what we advise for our patients. This other study in cell, again in humans, looked at the impact of different artificial sweeteners on the microbiome. And this is really interesting because actually um, a lot of people might say, oh, I'm not taking any sugar, 
but um, plenty of artificial sweeteners, and they're fine. But here, sucralose, stevia, aspartame all had impact on the gut microbiome. Some of it looks to be potentially um, less positive, but it's not that clear that that's necessarily the case. So are the changes here, the dysbiotic changes, positive or negative? Um, we need more data here. But this does, I think, just go to show that we should be testing our assumptions. A couple of other things that I'm going to go through a bit quicker. This now is looking at polyunsaturated fatty acids. You may find in various different cooking oils. You may find in some processed meats and um, uh, other cooked meats, for example. Um, and here, this is all in uh, mouse models, but a very neat mouse model that suggests a mechanism by which these uh, PUVAs, these N6 polyunsaturated fatty acids, may propagate inflammation in the small intestine. Not necessarily initiate it, but propagate it. I think that's a very interesting clue, potentially, in Crohn's disease. And then we have a, a slightly left field one here, but from an amazing paper published in Science this year, looking at a yeast, Debromyces hansii, that when you look in wounds, so inflamed bits of Crohn's disease, you see lots of this. And this, this is from, they've done this in a series of resection specimens. They've done this in a series of biopsies compared to um, normal biopsies and from controls, lots of this yeast. And then they've shown in these mouse models that actually when you have a wound and you have the yeasts there, um, in the context of antibiotics as well, you get much, much delayed wound healing and actually propagation of the inflammation. So there's this model whereby on the left, you can um, wound the, the um, intestinal epithelium and it heals. But on the right, when you have a Crohn's disease type situation, perhaps with antibiotics, you get this propagation of inflammation. So this is another interesting clue. This yeast of interest is is seen in rinds of some cheeses and you know on the on the outsides of some uh, processed meats, for example. But another example potentially where um, a dietary product, which this effectively is, is propagating, if not necessarily initiating inflammation. And here's one other really fascinating thing. This is a study in Nature this year looking at environmental factors a big environmental toxin screen that was done in zebrafish that was then um, expanded using machine learning analysis to lots of other different dietary, uh, sorry, environmental factors. And there's this one particular thing they find, propizamide, which is used in ornamental gardens. It's also used as a herbicide in um, fruit um, and vegetable production. And in this study, they demonstrated that the um, propizamide induced or worsened colitis in DSS models. And in fact, they did a very neat series of experiments that demonstrated this AHR, um, NF kappa B, C, EBP beta pathway that regulates intestinal inflammation that is targeted by propizamide. So it's complex. And it gets more complex still. This is starting to look at the metabolic nature underneath all of this, the inflammatory process, the impact of different genetic susceptibilities. There are some very interesting clues here, looking at some involved with the R stress, looking at things like the, the famine gene. Um, there's a lot of very interesting work going on here. But that's a more complex topic even still for another um, conversation. So I want to think next about dietary strategies that we may use to prevent IBD in at-risk individuals. I'm thinking at the patient journey. So we're going here, bottom left, to someone who doesn't have IBD, to the top right, to someone who's got very complex IBD. And we can see in these blue circles the areas where we don't have predictive power. Who gets IBD, who responds, etc. But here we're thinking about who gets IBD, so we can zoom in on that. And then we can zoom in even further. So if we think um, about the um, at-risk population, the target for prevention strategies, we can look at the inherited risk and early life events, genetics, family history, perinatal exposures, weaning and early life environment, lifestyle hygiene and antibiotic exposure and the microbiome. And if we study that before people get inflammation, then we will get a lot of clues. And this to me starts get, to get me thinking about 
whether or not we're going to be able to use diet as a strategy to prevent IBD in these at-risk individuals, this is something we are actively thinking about, and I think this is something that we will find answers for quite soon. So next, dietary strategies to treat inflammatory bowel disease. This is where a lot of the interest is, of course. Can we use diet to induce or maintain remission to prevent the disease from flaring as a monotherapy or as an adjunct to pharmatherapy? And here it is a minefield. It's a minefield for us as clinicians. It's a minefield for patients. It's a minefield for everyone. There's a lot of conflicting literature. There's a lot of very poor, poorly controlled, poorly conducted studies that are out there. And actually, there's just a paucity of good data overall. Let's start with where we know things work. Exclusive enteral nutrition, particularly in kids, but we use this a lot in adults too. In children with active luminal Crohn's disease, dietary therapy with exclusive enteral nutrition is recommended by all the major societies. It is as good as steroids. It heals the mucosa. It improves the inflammatory response. You can use it in small bowel or large bowel, via drink or nasogastric, polymeric or elemental. It works. Um, and you can even buy it on Amazon, although we encourage people not to do that work with dietitians. In adults, we use this a lot, particularly in flaring small bowel disease. Um, Rachel Cooney and others are now doing a very nice NIHR-funded study to see whether or not um, enteral nutrition um, preoperatively will help to improve post-surgical outcomes. This is a very large pragmatic study in over 600 patients across the UK, 40 units. We look forward to the outputs from this. The next study I'm going to show you is the Dine CD study from Jim Lewis, published in Gastroenterology earlier this year. And here, Jim and colleagues compared specific carbohydrate diet to a Mediterranean diet. 194 people randomized one to one to each diet. In the first six weeks, they had prepared meals, and then they did it themselves for six weeks. And it was looking at symptomatic remission with biomarkers. Um, as a secondary output. And what was great in this study was that both trials, both dietary interventions worked really well. You saw a significant improvement in symptomatic outcomes and um, in inflammatory response with both sim simple carbohydrate diet and the Mediterranean diet. Um, but, and it's quite important, but here there's no control. So we don't know which is um, working better than others. There's potentially quite a lot of confounders, potentially quite a lot of placebo response here too. But it does show you that you can do these complex studies and it gives us lots of hope moving forward. And here's another one published in Gut just in the last month from India. This is a very nice study, not perfect again, but very nice, looking at fecal microbial transplant that's delivered by colonoscopy here every week for seven or eight weeks. and an anti-inflammatory diet. And they took a group of patients with mild to moderate active UC that had both of those. So FMT plus diet for eight weeks, then diet, and then followed out to a year. Versus standard medical therapy. Standard medical therapy here was just mesalazine optimized and rectally. So this is not with advanced therapies um, and with very little steroid use. Nonetheless, it's a very intriguing study that showed a significant improvement both in the short term at week eight and in the longer term out to week 48. No control here with just SFMT versus the diet or diet, but you know, it's not perfect. But I think nonetheless, this is a very intriguing study with some good clues about how you might be able to reset the microbiome with FMT and then keep feeding the new microbiome an anti inflammatory diet. So that's the idea to then help it bed in over time. So next, diet to maintain remission. And here, I want to talk to you about the PREDICT study. I will come back soon with a lot of data from PREDICT. But for now, let me just give you an update as to where we are. This study was designed to help us answer patients' questions in the clinic. What should I eat? How should I stay well? What's the impact of IBD on my mood? Um, my lifestyle exercise and sleep, for example. And here we took 2,500 people in clinical remission, done a deep dive into their diet, their microbiome, their bloods, looking at environmental questionnaires, 
and looking at a lot into diet and then followed over 24 months. We've got half the cohort now followed for 48 months to look at those people that flare versus those people that do not. And we stopped recruitment at the start of the pandemic. So we've got 2,629 patients from around England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales. And we have a, a demographic split, as you can see in the middle, by age. And these patients have food frequency questionnaires. Um, they have food diaries. We've got microbiome that's being analyzed at the Sanger at the moment. All have calprotectin data and whole genome sequencing data too. Um, and the dietary data, of course, is pivotal to all of this. Um, and a couple of snippets, actually, that are interesting. We asked people um, what they thought caused their disease to flare. And most people said stress, um, number one. And most people, number two, said diet. Very interesting. And then when we looked at what diets people were using already to control their symptoms, many, many were already using some kind of diet, be it any IBD diet at the top, a low fiber, gluten free, low lactose, or exclusive enteral nutrition, as you might expect at the bottom. So that's interesting. Um, and we will have the data coming from that very soon. Lots of great um, work going on by the team there. So, what can we practically do today? Let's try and be sensible and give some advice to parents, to patients, to policymakers. And here is a. Um, graph I generated, a table I generated from the International Organization for IBD's guidance on environmental factors in IBD. It's quite interesting, um, and it's, um, it, it summarizes very neatly what we've learned to date, but a bit limited when it comes to diet, because the advice is to adopt diets that have been shown to work best in clinical trials, and currently, we don't have very much of that. So let's move on now to advice to the parents with IBD about their children. And the top three are the ones from this um, guidance, including um, encourage breastfeeding where possible. The bottom three I've added, um, and that includes limiting consumption of processed and ultra processed foods and to take plenty of diverse plant-based fibers if possible. This is for children. This is not designed to be um, Spoke, sorry, this is not designed to be, you know, gospel. You must do this, you mustn't do that, because life is for living. Behavioral changes are difficult. And that, I think, is my next big point. Diet is probably one of the biggest environmental modifiers or risk factors that there is. But there are major challenges. Behavioral change is difficult, adherence is challenging. We have key skills that are lacking, knowledge that is um, lacking when it comes to ingredients and cooking. There is a cost associated with all of this and currently a cost of living crisis. So all of this requires a solid evidence base, not just the dietary factors that might, we might find in the mouse models I've shown, not just the environment um, in terms of the epidemiological studies, um, but also interventional studies, not just of diets, but of policy change, of behavioral change, um, so in the meantime, I have a plea. My plea is to please, this is to all healthcare providers, approach this topic with sensitivity. We should not be too dogmatic. We should not be preachy. This is complicated, and there are significant limitations to what we already know, and there are significant issues to what we can maybe expect a person to do in their life. And so if we think in a bit more detail about adherence, you know, food is essential for life. Okay, that's obvious, and that makes it difficult to do placebo-controlled studies. But if we bear in mind also that processed and ultra-processed foods are highly addictive, they're designed to be that way. You know, they trigger dopamine pathways um, that, that drive that motivation to eat something that's deliciously, disgustingly unhealthy and makes us feel good in the short term. It's all designed that way. It's like our mobile phones designed by the companies, the tech companies to use, you know, TikTok and Instagram and Twitter and even YouTube to tweak the algorithm so that we keep watching. They're the most brilliant people in the planet are tweaking our dopamine pathways to get us addicted to the tech as well as to food. So we must be sensitive about this. So 
that's the big point. The next big point is that diets are hard to maintain. This is the adherence point. We know this from decades of weight loss trials and the industry there. And in IBD, maintenance is probably important. We know that for drug therapy. If we're trying to prevent the disease flaring, if we're trying to prevent IBD from developing in the first place, you know, how much um, slack is there if you deviate from what is ideal? Is there a window that where, you know, if you deviate, things will flare up or not, if indeed that's the case? So this is complicated. We need long-term pragmatic trials in the real world to help address these issues. But with all this, with those caveats, I'm very optimistic here. And I do think that dietary therapy will be one of the ways in which we can break through the therapeutic ceiling. Currently sat at about 30 to 40%, sometimes a bit higher already, I think. We're doing a lot already about this with earlier diagnosis, with earlier therapy, with non-invasive monitoring, and with some of the new small molecules and biologics we're seeing. Um, but I think if we can start to bolt onto this dietary therapies, dietary strategies, microbial therapies, combinations of those, I think we will start to get a long way forward. So I want to summarize now. There's been a lot there, and I urge you to check the show notes for more details um, and to go, please, uh, and check the, the timestamp so that you can go back to the relevant point. But here are my key summary messages. I don't think diet is the cause of IBD. It may not even be one of the causes of IBD, but I think it is a driver of inflammation. I think there is evidence to support that in some circumstances, and it might be more than that overall. It might be contributing to the cause of diet of, of IBD in some people. I think it's important. It appears to be the biggest. Uh, environmental factor that we're observing at the moment, but it's no means clear cut, and this is a complex area. Dietary therapy for IBD is something that we have a lot of hope for. I have many patients that come to my clinic now that have changed their diet, changed their lifestyle, and for whom very complicated disease has become very much more straightforward. I hope that we will be able to take lessons from the exclusive enteral nutrition story, to have diets that we can use to induce remission, to maintain remission, either as sole therapy or in combinations with medical strategies to help break the therapeutic ceiling. Prevention strategies may well be based around diet and microbial strategies and maybe also drug therapy. This could be to prevent disease onset in the first place, which would be great, and prevent the disease from flaring. But I think overall, the compliance with dietary therapy is an issue. And moreover, just to leave with this thought that we have a major personal and societal challenge at face here. And actually, a lot of this is societal. It's not an individual's problem per se if they're addicted to the junk food that is highly subsidized, that is cheap, that for which there is no limits apparently on marketing and advertisements. So what do we do? Well, I think what we need to do is have a very hard look in the mirror um, at what we're doing as a society and then try and work together to change policy so that we can look at healthier habits for eating, for lifestyle, for stress reduction. And I'm sure that if we do that, we will start to get on top of this scourge globally that is inflammatory bowel disease. Remember I said going to probably get to 2% of the population when we reach prevalence equilibrium. That's in the Western world. Most of the people in the world do not live in the Western world. There are big challenges there. So thanks for listening very much. Here is the summary. Um, here is uh, my team that have done a lot of great work um, with the work here. I really look forward to hearing from you in the comments section. If you've got to this um, very end of the video, congratulations. Um, thanks for listening, um, and that's all. Good night.